With the time we have, um, I've taken the liberty of departing from whatever the scheduled topic was, which I looked at and I thought for most of you might be boring. I thought what we really ought to talk about is what everybody's talking about. How many of you heard about stem cells lately? How many have heard about cloning lately? What's that got to do with the Bible? You say, is there, is there genetic manipulation in the Bible? Yes. In fact, you will not understand most of the Old Testament unless you really understand who the Rephaim really were. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So we're going to explore the biotech revolution. I like to call it the new sorcerer's apprentice. And where are we going? Well, there appear to be long-sought remedies emerging for many of the diseases that have been most elusive in our society in all kinds. Um, in fact, there are astonishing advances that are emerging in molecular biology, including, of course, the ultimate one is cloning. The idea that we'll actually be able to clone human beings, you've got to be kidding. No, the serious scientists are expecting to do that within a year or two. In fact, there are articles that they're expecting cloning baby factories and so forth. Uh, this is not fringe stuff. This is centerline uh, weirdness. <laughs> um, now, when you start seeing them growing human ears on mice, you ought to get uncomfortable because uh, there are some very serious concerns emerging by those that are best informed in terms of cross-species diseases and the rest. But there's also, we believe, some biblically relevant implications on the horizon. Our agenda will be briefly to look at this, first of all, uh, in terms of a panacea. We'll talk about the tissues. We'll do just a quick tutorial on the human cell and uh, some of that and the code of life because I think there's some tremendous lessons for us all there. But then we'll also talk not just about the tissues but the issues, what we're concerned about. We'll talk about what I'll call the dark side. Have we really opened a Pandora's box? We're tampering with the engines of creation. What are the prophetic implications of that? Now the reason I call a Sources Apprentice, most of you are familiar with the Desarberling uh, Magic Student thing by von Goethe that was made into a musical piece by Paul Dukas in 1897 called The Sources Apprentice, which was of course popularized in Walt Disney's Fantasia. That's why I use it as a, as a, a frame of reference for us, because you may recall the whole idea of that piece of literature was that a student so, uh, uh, created a spell uh, and didn't get it quite correct he unleashed forces that be, was, be, were uncontrollable and his teacher finally had to intervene to terminate the impending disaster. That's basically the theme that w uh, occupies that music. But it's also exactly what seems to be going on here. We're starting to tamper with things that are out of our control and it's going to take our designer's intervention to straighten the mess that we have out. If we were going to map a perspective of our physical reality, starting with the human body, which of course is composed of organs. The organs are composed of tissues, the tissues of cells. Within the cells, that's what I want to focus on a little bit, we have a miniature city full of molecular robots. And so below that atomic structure, some atomic particles, and we finally get to the boundaries of reality itself as we discover that subatomic particles have no, ro no locality. We'll talk a little bit about that. But the cells, and these molecular robots are something that we each need to be a little bit more aware of. So I'd like to talk briefly about um, what I call a constellation of miracles. The miniature city that we call the cell. Now, Michael Denton summarizes very well in his work back in 1986. He says, although the tiniest bacterial cells, although they're incredibly small, each is in effect a veritable micro-miniaturized factory containing thousands of exquisitely designed pieces of intricate molecular machinery made up of a hundred billion atoms far more complicated than any machine built by man and absolutely without parallel in the non-living world. The simple cell. All of us in school probably saw a textbook that had a little diagram of what they call the simple cell. It turns out there isn't such an animal. The simplest cell is more complicated, it's beyond our imagining. It, is, has, it has a central memory bank, it has assembly plants and processing units, it has repackaging and shipping centers, robot machines in the form of protein molecules that consist typically of 3,000 atoms in three-dimensional configurations, and there's hundreds of thousands of different kinds of these machines that make up the, the composite. And they communicate with elaborate communication systems that we have yet to understand. And they also have quality control and error-correcting mechanisms. Now, if we were going to make a model of a simple cell, let's assume we decided to embark on a project to build a model of a cell 1,000 million times larger than life. 
Well, that would make each atom about the size of a tennis ball. We would need 10 million million atoms, about 10 to the 13th. That's quite a number. If you, ha if you had to count them at one per minute, it would take you 19 million years to count them. That's a lot. And this model that we would make would be over 10 miles in diameter. You get a feeling that this thing is big and complicated? Absolutely. Now we speak of the cell, we glibly make little diagrams saying that, well, it's surrounded by a plasma membrane. What we fail to realize is that in that membrane are gateways with special signal receptors and security guards to monitor what goes in and goes out. The center of the cytoplasm, of course, has as a, it, the core, it's its nucleus, which is its information center, which includes a master library with which everything uh, is coordinated. Inside that, we have automated factories and product manufacturing facilities. All this is powered by power stations. The mitochondrions are power plants and the energy sources for this miniature city. And they have a, uh, a bunch of things they call the Golgi apparatus that process, package, uh, ship, and pre prepare for export the various products. And they also have vesicules which uh, transport and take care of trash disposal and all that sort of thing. Now, we have rope, this thing is populated with robot machines in hundreds of thousands of different types, as I said, and they communicate by means of digital languages and decoding systems. Memory banks for information storage and control systems for regulating all this and indulges in prefabrication and modular construction. It has proofreading and error correction devices for quality control. Now, as some of you know, I spent six years of my executive career at the Ford Motor Company. In, at Ford, we were very proud of our very unique facility in Dearborn called the Ford River Rouge uh, plant. Now, this is a plant that's the largest integrated ma manufacturing facility in the world. It has about 100 miles of railroad within the plant. Under one roof, they receive raw limestone, raw iron ore, and coal go in one end. They manufacture under that roof their own steel, their own glass, their own paint, they have an automated plant that builds the engines. They have a manufacturing line for all the rest. They assemble the mixed models, different cars of different kinds of different colors, as you all know. And anyway, the point, the raw materials go in one end, new cars come out the other. It's, a, it's considered the largest integrated manufacturing facility in the world. The reason I bring it up is the cell, your simplest cell, is more complicated than the River Rouge plant. And your cell can do something the River Rouge plant can't do. It is capable of replicating its entire self within a few hours. And by the way, all cells derive from previous cells. We know of no case where a cell comes from a startup. All cells derive from a prior cell. Think about that. Now there's a choreography that I can't resist including in this briefing to give you a flavor of what goes on every hour or two in every cell of your body. And that's a choreography that's absolutely breathtaking of uh, the choreography of the chromosomes. Mitosis is the splitting of the nucleus, uh, cytokinesis is the splitting of the cell itself. And what you have in the cell is that all the chromosomes condense and the, the nucleus will dissolve. Then a strange mitotic spindle starts to form. Now you ask yourself, who's orchestrating this? Nobody knows. How do they all know that they stop what they're doing and prepare for this dance that's going to go on? The mitotic spindle starts to form. The, all the chromosomes have duplicated themselves into pairs and await the rest of the dance. And we'll go into the next phase, the metaphase. As this mitotic spindle, notice they don't connect. The, each mitotic spindle knows exactly where it is to, supposed to connect on one of the uh, kinetochores of the uh, chromosomes. The question is, gee, how do they know where to go? How can they see where they're supposed to go? Who's coordinating all this? Nobody knows. This whole dance, which is essential to life, of course got all designed by chance. This is all the result of a random accident. But I want you to notice that the metodic spindle finds its location when it finally gets connected to all of these various chromosome pairs. We're ready for the next phase. And I'll take the next two phases together to save time. What happens now, you notice the nuclei have dissolved. How does it know that these, these, these miniature cities have, res, have decided to dissolve? The, the mitotic spindle pulls apart these, pair, 
these pairs. So now there's a total duplication of the chromosomes available. They migrate to the opposite ends of this cell. And somehow this is all being coordinated, coached, whatever, quarterbacked, if you will. And pretty soon what happens is two nuclei start to form. I don't know how they're supposed to know when to do this, but it's all tightly coordinated. And you'll see the two nuclei form. And then a group of microfilaments start to pinch it off in the middle. And obviously you're about to see two cells. And so cytokinesis has been completed. One cell, you now have two exact duplicates. Now what's strange is that this exact duplication continues for a while. But then later something even stranger occurs. But before we get into that, I'd like to talk a little bit, we speak glibly about these chromosomes. I want you to imagine this assignment. Imagine that you had two strands of monofilament fishing line 125 miles long. Can you visualize that? A pair of, uh, okay. What I want you to do is make an arrangement so that you can pack that 125 mile pair into a basketball. And how would you do that so that you could untangle it, read it, and put it back without tangling? I want you to be able to unzip it, copy it, restore it on spools at three times the speed of an airplane propeller without tangling. <laughs> this all goes on continually in your body every time that somebody on the factory floor needs a copy of the master record to tell it what to do. The, the, the DNA is unzipped, cop, a copy made, a working copy for the factory floor. This occurs all the time, continually. And it all happens. Now, if we take the chromatin and unravel it, you then get what they call the condensed chromatin, and you unravel what they call the loop domain. As you unravel that, you discover it's made up of a whole string of spools, little tiny nucleosomes, as they call them. And around each one, of course, is arranged what you and I have come to recognize as the famous double helix or the uh, DNA itself. Your DNA is about six feet long and, and it's all wrapped up in a microscopic um, location. Now most of you have seen computer models or representations. I want you to notice this double helix of the DNA is, is, um, consists of a, like a ladder of code pairs. There's an alphabet of four letters always used in pairs. Three out of four of these code pairs will define any of the 20 amino acids that make life possible. This is an error-correcting digital code. If you know anything about computer design, you know that couldn't happen by accident. It had to be very skillfully designed. See, life is digitally defined, and that's what Genesis says in Genesis 125. It says, God made the beast of the earth after his kind, the cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth after his kind. They are digitally defined. They're not analog, they're digital. What do I mean by digital? It's like a watch. If you have a watch with hands, that's analog. If you have a watch that says, uh, uh, you know, you have 39 seconds left in your talk, it's a three and a nine, you know, um, that's, th those are digits. They take their meaning by arbitrary definitions. They're, des they're, 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 they're designed. They, can't even, they, 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 don't them ran they don't happen randomly. Now see, the ultimate technology are thoughts expressed in language. You need to discern the difference between the technology of content and the technology of conveyance. There's a difference between the technology to get a radio signal to your home and a television set and the technology that may be involved in the play or the software that you're watching, if you will. The manuscript versus the media, if you will. Did the ink write the book? You can talk about binding paper and ink. It's got nothing to do with the technology of the manuscript itself. Is it in German? Is it in English? Is it whatever? Is it music? Is it text? You follow me? Totally different technologies. Now the code of life, of course, the DNA, and I'll just zip through this. We've just recently mapped the 3.1 billion letters in the human genome, thanks to the competition between the private sector and the government consortium. And they're five years ahead of schedule. They're expecting a gold mine of medical breakthroughs through all of this. But the, the frontier science really isn't microbiology, it's information science. They need to study coding systems that are more sophisticated than most of the cryptography that occupies our National Security Agency. And the element of language, of course, includes semantics. What, is the, what do the symbols mean? Remember Paul Revere's ride? The simplest example of a signal, of course, is Paul Revere. Remember when you watched the Old North Church? 
One if by watching the lanterns, one if by land, two if by sea. The first bit of information carried no information. It was just proof that the guy didn't fall off the ladder. He got up there. Right? It's the second bit that told him that that's where all the information was. And uh, it also took syntax. Those lanterns couldn't be anywhere. They had to be in the Old North Church. The position is important. Now, the most advanced computers, if the British had had great computers, they could not have broken that code because it's got nothing to do. It's, it's, it's all took its significance by an arbitrary predefinition. If I wrote on the blackboard, M-A-N, what does that spell? Man, why? Because we've agreed on that beforehand. It didn't happen randomly. It happened by very skillful design uh, from the beginning. So anyway, let's move on. We have simple alphabets. You can make an alphabet's error correcting. We do that in computer. We call it parity checks. You can make tests on your code to see if there's an error. Some of those tests can be such that not only tell you if there's an error, they can tell you where the error is. They can be error correcting. If you've ever had an opportunity to see the Super Sage machines, the solid state uh, air, air defense systems, they're built on an 11-bit byte in which uh, you can pull the cards out of the computer while it's running and it, it keeps going because it error corrects and it's possible to do that and you course also have adaptive coding where codes change depending on the needs those are very sophisticated but we find them in the human cell now the building blocks of life of course are amino acids there are hundreds of amino acids but there's only 20 that are responsible for all of life in, in the universe and by the way they're all left-handed mathematically they're a molecule that's left-handed if they occurred randomly you'd have half left half right but the right-handed ones are lethal to the left-handed ones. They always joke about, you know, talk about the monkeys in the typewriter. If you had enough monkeys typing for a million years randomly, you'd eventually get Shakespeare's play or something. That, of course, is nonsense for lots of reasons, but how far would the monkeys get if every other key in the typewriter was lethal to the monkey? You see? <laughs> and most proteins are a linear sequence of somewhere between 100 to 500 of these amino acids, and they're of different kinds. The actual molecular diagrams are complicated, but there are certain patterns that allow you to really follow what's going on. There are 20 amino acids uh, that make up life. Half of them are non-soluble in water. Half of them are soluble in water. The, the non-polar ones, the non-soluble ones, form the core of it. The other ones give it its external characteristics. And some of those are positively charged, which makes it basic. And a couple of them are negatively charged, which makes it acidic. And by these properties and by the sequence they're assembled, it causes that chain to fold up to become a three-dimensional machine to do whatever it is supposed to, it is supposed to do. Now, let's. Uh, this alphabet is a three out of four digital code, and I won't get into all the details except to just visualize it as a. As it usually goes by four letters, A, T, G, or C. Those are, that's the alphabet they deal with, and uh, it's interesting that they always come in pairs. Whenever you have an A, a T will naturally bond with it. Whenever you have a G, a C will naturally bond with it and vice versa. So if you have a string of these codes, their complement will intrinsically join it. And that gives it a self-replicating capability. Because if you tear this apart, its complement will join it. And you end up with a code that intrinsically can copy itself without error. That's the way the thing can split without uh, uh, errors. Now, the DNA that you have is your master file. That's your master record in the central library. You make a copy of that when you need to do something called the RNA. Visualize that like a photocopy. And that gives you, that you send that to the factory floor to manufacture these robots, these proteins that uh, make up the city. Now, the Crick dogma always assumed, for lots of reasons, that you go from the master record to a copy, and the copy goes to the floor. And if you have corruption in the, mas in the copy, fine, that can be repaired. One of the disturbing discoveries in recent years is that you, it, you have it able to go the other way. What happens if you took your master record, went to a Xerox machine, only to discover that occasionally your Xerox machine would change your master record? Would that make you uncomfortable? You bet. And that's what happens when they discover what they call a retrovirus, which has the capability to go uphill, to go back and reach in and change the master record. That's what's behind the problem with HIV and all of that. Now, when you take a DNA and copy, here's something else interesting. When you take DNA and you make an exact copy, it turns out you don't really want the exact copy. You want an excerpt from it. And so what the uh, robots do, they extract the parts you don't want, which are called introns, and they reassemble what's left, called exons. This is exactly the kind of coding 
that we discover in the biblical text. Biblical text. There it's called the equidistant letter sequences, where every seventh letter spells out something that's relevant to what's going on, and so forth. If you've heard about the Bible codes, it's the exact thing that's going on in your DNA as we uh, go to get the messenger RNA. Um, I won't go through the alphabet issues. Uh, these uh, three, any combination, three out of these four letters define one of the 20 amino acids plus some punctuation stop and start bits. And we could go through that. I won't take the time here. We've got more important things to talk about. The code will adapt itself if it's dealing with the power systems, but that's mechanics. What happens if you have a string of these codes, you need some kind of robot to read it and manufacture what it's telling you to manufacture. It looks sort of like a tape recorder. You've got a, a transfer RNA device that reads it like a recording machine. And as it goes along, it takes the code and builds the protein to get a string, uh, a protein chain that then becomes the robot that you're trying to build from the master copy. And, uh, now, and uh, then that chain will fold its up on itself because of the chemical and electrical charges uh, into a three-dimensional machine that is to do some particular function. Let's take one example. Let's take hemoglobin. Your hemoglobin is 574 amino acids long. These 574 amino acids have to be in the right sequence. You have 36 of these are glycine, 68 are alanine. Of the 20 different types, you have a total of 574. Now it turns out from mathematic, mathematical switching theory, you can tell what the chances are of getting that right by accident. Okay? It's called specificity, and that's the formula. To make a long story short, you have, with 574 elements chosen from an alphabet of 20, you've got 10 with 650 zeros after it as your chance, do it, get it by chance. Now here's the point. If you get it wrong, that's called hemo, uh, uh, hemoglobinopathy. It's, it's, it's fatal. Sickle cell anemia is a derivative of this. In other words, they have to be precisely right. Could that happen by chance? Mathematically impossible. You want, you want 10 to the 650th power? There are only 10 to the 18th seconds in the history of the universe if you accept the 15 billion year history of the universe that the scientists talk about. There are only 10 to the 66th atoms in our entire galaxy. There are only 10 to the 80th particles in our galaxy. 10 to the 650th power. See, in physics, anything that's more rare than one chance in 10 to the 50th is defined as absurd. So 10 to the 650th is not anywhere in the realm of having been occasioned by chance. It had to be designed and designed very skillfully. Now there's an idea that they were indebted to Michael Behe for the concept of irreducible complexity. How many of you ever handled a mousetrap? It has five parts. For years they've tried to make a better one, it's pretty hard. They have a wooden platform, a hammer, a, a spring, a holding bar to hold the hammer back, and a catch to hold the holding bar. Five parts. You have to have all five to catch a mouse. If you have four of the five parts, you don't catch four-fifths as many mice. <laughs> okay? That's called nonlinearity. You need all five. Follow me? That's called irreducible complexity. Let me give you an example in real life. Here's a bacteria. It's a single-celled creature that has a little tail that propels it through fluids, right? Here's a diagram of it. I won't get, it's a single-celled creature. I want to look at the place that the flagellum joins the cell wall. Here's a, a microphotograph of it. It has, it's an electric motor. It has D-rings. It has multiple armatures. It has a double wall protection. There are 40 parts to this, any one of which is missing, it doesn't work. It's an example of irreducible complexity in real life. Here's the equivalent electrical diagram of it. Any one part missing, it's busted. Did this happen by chance? Hardly. Very skillful design. The real issue, the reason the Darwinists can't explain the origin of life is because they cannot explain the origin of information. The origin of information. Which came first, the DNA or the proteins? You can't, it takes protein to construct DNA, and you takes DNA to construct proteins. Which came first? Come on, guys. You know, both had to be created at the same time for, and designed to a consistent system architecture. Those, that same code, those same acids, are the ingredients of all life in the universe, which proves it all came from the same design team. It came, all came from the same software house. Okay? 
All right. Psalm 19, we all know the first four verses. The heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament showeth his handiwork, day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out throughout all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. Now, what's interesting about this passage is the information science emphasis. The heavens declare, day to day utter speech, knowledge, speech, language, words. Information science is the issue that underlies all of this. See, the origin of information can't be explained. The irreducible complexity refutes design by chance or accident. The choreography of the chromosomes defies any random theories. Digital codes demand pre-planning. No system dependent upon subsystems can survive random failures. It takes design, skillful design. Well, let's move on. We've talked about the tissues. Now let's jump into some of the issues. We're tampering with the engines of creation. I want you now to stop and put yourselves in this picture. By the way, anyone that thinks that some of these ethical issues are simple are naive. You have, put yourself in this, you have a six-year-old daughter or son who has a rare bone marrow disease, anemia, bleeding disorders, severe immune problems, and likely to die of leukemia within the year. Can you picture that? Try to put yourself in those shoes. Your doctor tells you that there's a 90% chance of curing your child through a cell transplant technique from an umbilical cord of a matched sibling, which requires, of course, the use of a screened embryo. What would you do? What would you do? Would you take advantage of that? Of course you would. This is an actual case. Molly Nash was born with Fanconi anemia, distant for leukemia. The only effective treatment known is to get a batch of healthy cells from a perfectly matched sibling to replace the child's faulty bone marrow cells. And since each parent carries both a normal and a faulty version of the Vanconi gene, each pregnancy has a 25% chance of having an affected child subsequently. So what they do? They created embryos by standard in vitro fertilization in a laboratory dish tested for the presence of the disease gene. Only those testing normal are then transferred to a woman's uterus only two of 15 tested were normal, and only one of those two was healthy enough for transfer to Lisa Nash's womb, which they did. This designer baby saved the sister. The Colorado couple used genetic tests to create a test tube baby that would have the exact type of cells desperately needed to save their six-year-old daughter. She now has a 90% chance of being free from our disease. Genetic screening is clearly going to be part of our society, our culture. And that little girl is healthy today. Her baby brother, that was, whose umbilical cord was used, he's also doing fine. So the family's doing fine. So this is, this is real life stuff, and it's going to be more and more. See, we're dealing here with the issue of differentiation. There's a very strange mystery that goes on in cytokinesis. If cytokinesis results in identical ch cells when they split, why do they differentiate? If two become four, and four become eight, and eight become sixteen, and so forth, identically, what's happening when they suddenly start differentiating? Because you know what happens. Pretty soon you get some different ones. There's a dark line goes down the middle. It's the backbone. And as the time goes on, you have, of course, these identical cells differentiate into 210 different types of cells that become the tissues that make up the organs that make up the embryo. Why do they, do they differentiate? And you all have seen these, uh, um, the, you know, the, the, the development of the embryos. Before they, while they're still undifferentiated, they're called stem cells. They use a code of four to define the 20 amino acids that make up 100,000 different proteins to make the cell operate. But then for some reason, unknown at the sta present stage of understanding, they start differentiating. They be and before they differentiated, they're called stem cells. And there's over 200 different kinds of cells that uh, get differentiated that make up the tissues and organs. There's a total of 10 to the 13th cells in your body, which is a bunch. Now, what you, one of the crafts here is to take a nucleus from some other or, uh, uh, entity and take this nucleus out of the stem cell, put that nucleus in. It's called uh, a nuclear transfer. That's what we call cloning. And you end up then with a replica of the donor. And that's what, that's what cloning is all about, properly called nuclear transfer. And we all know about a clone of sheep's clothing, the famous dolly sheep in Scotland. A needle-making machine is the key to the whole thing where they were able to remove the nucleus, 
and, ins and insert a nucleus, a nucleus of a donor, and the, the uh, dolly, the sheet, is a, a replica of the original donor, uh, born on a surrogate mother. What they don't tell you is it took 277 failures along the way before they got one that worked. Cloning has become common. They now do it to monkeys, they do it to pigs and uh, cattle, and it's widely practiced for and great experimentation going on. And uh, the, one of the mysteries is why do they replicating cells differentiate? They don't know yet. Now, genetic engineering involves the manipulation of stem cells to produce desired tissues. And of course, nuclear transfer being cloning makes complete beings. And of course, there's huge moral, ethical, legal issues here. One of the questions that you're going to have to ponder some, somewhere along the way, can a cloned human being get saved? A big debate about that for lots of reasons. When does tampering with an embryo become murder? Is it acceptable to clone a baby to save a child's life? That was the moral dilemma the Colorado couple had to face. When does human life begin? A minister and a priest, a Catholic priest and a rabbi were arguing about this. And the minister said, no, oh, human life begins at birth. And the Catholic priest says, you're really out of date. Human life begins at conception. The rabbi listened to them argue for a while. He says, both you guys are mixed up. Life begins when the dog dies and the kids are off to college. How will clones affect our society if there are cloned human beings running around? Will they be second-class citizens? Will they be a differentiated group? Daniel seems to think so. I'll come back to that. And can a human clone be come saved? A lot of good theologians will have different points of view on that. And what are the prophetic implications? If this is coming on our society, has the, has the Bible anticipated it? Absolutely. One other footnote, just a few days ago we learned, the scientists in Los Angeles and Massachusetts now believe that they can coach an unfertilized egg to start mitosis and become an embryo. They've discovered that with the right electrical and chemical stimuli, they can coax an unfertilized egg into mitosis and produce an embryo yielding stem cells. So they can make stem cells that, from an unfertilized egg. This was first discovered in sea urchins. They've been able to do it with limited success in mice. The embryos don't survive a long time so far until they find out why. But this could be an end run on some of the moral dilemmas. Because you could argue that that's not really an embryo, it's not a fertilized egg. And maybe a source, an acceptable source of stem cells for medical research. But let's talk a little bit about the dark side. Is this a panacea for mankind or is it a Pandora's box we've opened? Now let's not get reactionary. These guys are going against very, very serious objectives to try to find cures for AIDS, mental illness, autoimmune diseases, obesity, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Huntington's, Lou Gehrig's disease, heart disease, and of course cancer. The leading cause of death after heart disease is cancer, 24%. 40% of Americans have already or will have cancer. 20% will die from it, 30% caused by smoking, 30% by poor diet and lack of exercise, spending too much time on speaking platforms. <laughs> and there's also remedies being sought for things you and I can't even pronounce. And I won't go through this and embarrass my, my lack of background. Let's go on. One of the concerns is that there are very few safeguards against errors or abuse during the research. This research is not being done in controlled environments, not being done in government labs, not being done in large corporate facilities. It's done by garage startups all over the world. Thousands of companies being formed by the month all over the world, not just in the U.S., to experiment in this area in a race for patents and insights. And as they start messing around with cross-species uh, uh, games, you're going to find that there's unknown diseases and complications emerging. And uh, I use this little mouse as perhaps one of the more grotesque examples. The potential for self-replicating mutations are all impossible to fully anticipate. And of course, there's few procedural disciplines. Uh, there's small, intensely competitive laboratories and, and so forth. Very few controls. We're tampering with the human genome. Has this happened before? Yes. In Genesis 6. And also after that, Genesis 6 warns us with the Rephaim and so forth. The days of Noah that Jesus talks about. The days of Noah that are social the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Be. What were the days of Noah like? And what did Daniel mean when he talked about the miry clay? 
It's been there all along. I've never noticed it in verse 43 of Daniel 2. We'll take a look at that. And what implications might have this for some of the strange goings on we see in, Gen in uh, Revelation and elsewhere. Genesis chapter 6, the first two verses are a single sentence. Everybody misses that. Genesis 6 verse 1 and 2 are a single sentence. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them that the B'nai HaElohim, the sons of God, a term used exclusively for angels in the Old Testament, saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose. Weird goings on. Notice these are the same sentence that avoids a lot of other errors. B'nai HaElohim, it is always used of angels and uh, it's in Job and other places. Um, in the book of Enoch, which is useful for grammar and, and, and uh, vocabulary of the period. The Septuagint, the translation of the Old Testament into the highly precise Greek, three centuries before Christ was born, clearly identifies this term as angels. A few verses later, explains what the results were. There were Nephilim in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children unto them, the same became the mighty men which were of old men of renown. I thought angels who had no sex. That's not what the scripture says. It says the angels in heaven don't marry. It's a different statement altogether. I won't get into that here. We'll keep moving. The Nephilim, it comes from the word the fallen ones, from the verb nephal, to be fall, to be cast down, to fall away, to desert. Nephilim are the fallen ones. These are the hybrids. This was Satan's strategy to corrupt the human race to prevent a Messiah. Yes, they were giants, but in the Septuagint, the word was translated gigantes, which is transliterated giants in the English. They were giants, but that's not what the word means. It means earthborn. In the Hebrew, in the Old Testament, we find a similar term called the Rephaim. Sometimes translated giants in your English, sometimes translated dead. You might appropriately call them, if you look at all the verses and put it together, the living dead. Strange creatures. Why did God tell Joshua to wipe out every man, woman, and child of certain tribes? because they had a gene pool problem. One of the things that brought about the flood of Noah was a gene pool problem. In Genesis 6 verse 9 it tells us one of the distinctives of Noah was that he, had, he was a just man and he was perfect in his generations. And the word there is tamim which means without blemish, sound, healthful, without spot, unimpaired. It's used of physical blemishes. And uh, well we'll keep moving. Jesus in his prophetic discourse his confidential briefing to his four disciples in Matthew 24 said, But as the days of Noah were, so shall the days of the coming of the Son of Man be. Now what he may have meant is simply that it was business as usual until they went, entered the ark. Many scholars would see it that way. But others who have studied this carefully also feel he was saying something more than that. And uh, so we're, uh, there's a, it's interesting that the classical view of Genesis 6, what's called the angel view, that these are fallen angels bent on mischief, was the view of all the ancient rabbis. It was the view of the early church up until the fifth century. But the fifth century emerges an alternative view because it was a little less spooky and a little more comfortable. It's called the lines of Seth. And that is the view that's taught in most seminaries today. The tragedy is has absolutely no scriptural support. The fallen angel view is the view of the ancient scholars, Hebrew scholars, the view of the early church. It prevails among conservative scholarship today and it's confirmed in the New Testament in Jude and Second Peter. What's also interesting is that same concept is embodied in the ancient legends of virtually every ancient culture on the planet Earth. In Sumer, Assyria, Egypt, Incas, the Mayan, the, the Epic of Gilgamesh, Persia, Greece, India. The Greek, the Greek Titans and all that are all echoes of the same kind of shenanigans way back in the mystery uh, early chapters of Genesis. The, South, the Sioux Indians, um, we could go on and on. When you talk about Hercules, or Atlas of the Greek mythology, you're talking about what the Hebrews would call Nephilim, the unnatural hybrids of this stuff. Now, uh, let's just zip through this. I won't beat a dead horse here. The early church fathers held that view. Modern scholarship uh, also holds that view. Uh, the Sethite view is easily shredded from the text. But what startled me when we researched this, this has not only confirmed the New Testament, you won't understand most of the passages in the Old Testament unless you really understand that, uh, that what I call the angel view. That happened, things that happened after the flood and in the current prophecy. Satan has strategies, you can look at the Bible as Satan's strategies to corrupt the human line to prevent a Messiah. In Genesis 6 we've talked about as God tells Abraham he's going to work through Abraham, now Satan can focus. When he tells Abraham, he, his people return to Canaan in 400 years, 
Satan had 400 years to lay down a minefield. And uh, whether you talk about the destruction of the male line at Exodus, whether you talk, whether you talk about Pharaoh's pursuit subsequently in Exodus 14, uh, and so when God says, I'm going to work through David, David singled out for special treatment. Satan has, uh, was able, the more we have, more prophetic visibility we have, the more Satan can focus his stratagems. And uh, the population of Canaan, we have the post-flood of Nephilim, that's mentioned in Genesis 6, it happened also after that, after the flood. And they're encountered in Canaan when, when uh, Moses sent the 12 spies. They came back in Numbers 13, 33, says there are Nephilim in the land, these fallen ones. And, and we are like grasshoppers before them. We're pretty hard on those ten guys. Remember that Og, the king of the giants, was 13 feet tall. Think about going up against a warrior like that. A serious problem. The Rephaim, these were a race of giants, except they're more than just giants. We encounter them in Genesis 14, 15 and following. The Moabites called them the Emim. The Ammonites called them the Zamzumim. There's others. The same term is also translated dead. Isaiah tells us that they're not eligible for resurrection. Strange thing. We have Aunt Arba and Anak and his seven sons, the Anakim. We have Og, the king of Bashan in Deuteronomy 3 and, 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 and so on. It's interesting that Joshua is told to wipe out every man, woman, and child of those tribes. He does almost. But the places that he fails to do so, in the Golan Heights, in Gaza, Ashdod, and so forth. It's the places that the PLO have their conclaves today. Strangely, strange stuff. And Goliath and his four brothers. We took a four by four up in the Golan Heights. There is a monument up there that's sort of like a Stonehenge called Gilgal Raphaim. It's never been excavated. We know very little about it. What's strange is you can only tell what it is from the air. It's about five circles, 20 ton stones, dated about 3000 BC. It's on a flat plateau, only visible from the air, about 10 miles. And there's a number of these that have never been excavated, never been studied yet. But, um, and the Anakim are just an example where J Joshua is told to um, uh, wipe them out. But verse 22 says, There was none of the Anakim left in the land of the children of Israel. Only in Gaza and Gath and Ashdod there remained. I think that's <laughs> interesting. King of Og, Og uh, in the kingdom of Bashan, which reigned in Ashtaroth and Indre, the remainder of the remnant of the giants, that is, the there weren't giants there, it's actually the word Rephaim, for these did Moses smite and cast them out. The king, the, the, Bashan was the final region of these Rephaim. And um, the, the king of Bashan had an iron bed nine cubits long. That's somewhere between 13 and 16 feet, depending what cubit you use. There's a strange passage I haven't any, had anyone explain to me in Psalm 22, which reads as if it's by Jesus Christ as he hung on the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And so on. Verse 12 Apparently, if you visualize Jesus saying this, he says, the bulls of Bashan have encircled me. What on earth does that mean? I have no idea, but I think it warrants some very serious research. And of course, Isaiah indicates that they, the Rephaim, shall not live, they are deceased, they shall not rise. Therefore thou hast visited and destroyed them and made their memory to perish and so forth. There's a passage in Daniel, most of us are familiar with Daniel 2, Nebuchadnezzar's polymetallic image. The gold, silver, brass, iron, iron mixed with clay, you all know that. In Daniel 7, there's a, a, another vision given to Daniel directly, different idioms used, but the same subject, basically the sequence of empires, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and then Rome in two phases. Most of you have studied this, but I want to focus on something strange, and that's this iron mixed with clay. What on earth does that mean? Now, I, for, for many decades, I, like most conservative Bible scholars, have taught that clay is people. You're the potter, I'm the clay. It's an idiom. It's actually in Aramaic, it's miry clay. Daniel explains the miry clay. Now miry clay is clay made from mire, or is dust. Dust is usually synonymous, idiomatically, with death. Whereas thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, Daniel switches to a personal pronoun, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. But they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. This, the grammar here requires that the they have to be something other than the seed of men. Or it doesn't make sense. What are they? I don't know. Are they Nephilim? That would echo maybe what Jesus said as the days of Noah were, so shall the days of the coming of the Son of Man be. Or are the they 
the results of genetic manipulation that's gone awry? Don't know. The context of Nebuchadnezzar's dream implies that they constitute a political constituency. They're numerous, not just a few exceptions. Well, we've gone through a whole bunch of uh, concerns about uh, the whole area of genetic manipulation. Um, something else you might find interesting about bacteria, these are single-celled elements, remember? These bacteria are single cells. They've discovered they do quorum, what they call quorum sensing. In your body, you may have bacteria that are dangerous to you, but they're not numerous enough to cause a problem. What the bacteria do is they take a roll call. They find out if there's enough of them around to make it worthwhile to attack. If there is, they attack. This is true of E. coli, Salmonella, and, and 30 others, a whole bunch of them. It reminds you of the passage in Luke 14, which says, suggests that what king going to war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able to 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000. Quorum sensing. Scientists are hoping to discover how they communicate because if they can interdict that communication, they can render those bacteria harmless. Interesting stuff. Well, we've talked about most of these other things that retroviruses skip generations and the whole idea that you can engineer directable intruders. That was a theme of a popular movie, uh, Mission Possible 2, dwelt on the idea of engineering both the malady and its cure as a form of economic and political power. Now, there are three technologies that we're trying to follow closely. One is what's called nanotechnologies. This is in the computer field where they're learning how to make molecular-sized robots, machines. They can make machines that do things. Very primitive at the moment, but they're working hard in that area. The goal of nanotechnology is to make molecule-sized machines. The goal of robotics, that's another field of study, their goal is to make self-modifying sentient machines, machines that we can reprogram themselves. In other words, computer-driven uh, devices. There's a third field called genetics whose goal, in part, is the self-replication of manipulated entities. Now, what's spooky is you've got to recognize that these three technologies are destined to converge. The nanotechnologists and the robotics and the geneticists all talk to each other, and they all have something to contribute to each other. What is the goal of the convergent technologies? To create self-replicating, sentient machines capable of directable diseases targeting specific groups or individuals. It seems feasible to engineer a virus that will attack only certain combinations of DNA, certain genetic groups, or maybe even individuals. There are people in history that if they had that technology, it would be terrifying. There's the, the most audacious of all these projects that I've run into is the Clone Jesus Project. There are serious people that are going to attempt, or are attempting, to get a DNA sample from some appropriate religious relic, do a nuclear transfer to a stem cell, and there are 40 women that have volunteered, virgin women, that to, to be the surrogate mother. One of these projects claims a target date of December 25th of this year. Now this may just be a fundraising scam, I wouldn't put too much on it, but, and it's also, in, at this stage especially of, of technology, absurdly risky. Dolly took 276 failures, and those failures put the mother at risk, not just the embryo. Now the other side of this, it's kind of, I think, kind of amusing, if they use the Shroud of Turin to try to get one of these DNA samples, which is one of the speculations, they may not get the guy they think they're getting. There are a couple of scholars that believe, they may not be right, but they believe that that Shroud is the Shroud of Jacques de Molay. He was the, land grand, he was the last Grand Master of the Knights Templar. He was executed in a parody of the crucifixion back in 1314, and there are some scholars who think that's really where the shroud came from. So if they're right, and they succeed at getting a clone here, they may not get the guy they were thinking they're getting. And of course, this is going to be, there's already novels starting to come out in which they try to clone Jesus, but really get the Antichrist and that sort of thing. But there is a strange verse in Revelation 17, verse 11, most of you that have studied Revelation 17 come across this verse speaking of the beast 
that was and is not, and even he is of the he is the eighth, but is of the seven and goeth into perdition. What does that verse mean? I have no idea. I've studied Revelation for forty years and I've read all the conjectures and there's but none of them really have impressed me too much. I'm not sure what that means. And there's many conjectures, as I say. But from the point of view of genetic engineering, you read this now, it may have a whole different complexion than was anticipated in the past. The beast that was and is not, even that's the Antichrist, if you will, he is the eighth, after seven that had been talked about, he is the eighth, but is of the seven and goeth into perdition. Is he a clone of one of the other seven? Could be. Who knows? Interesting. One comment I will make as you study the restrainer in 2 Thessalonians 2, I believe the restrainer in 2 Thessalonians 2 is restraining far more than you and I have any capacity to imagine. Every time I've studied the scripture and discovered that I have to repair some view I had of previous years, and there's been a number of times I've had to do that, it's always been in the direction that I didn't take it literally enough. The more I've studied the scripture, the more I've been driven more and more to take it more and more literally. I go through Revelation today and take it even more literally than I ever have. If I was going to make a movie of what I thought the world would be like right after the rapture, I don't think it would be believable because I think it's going to get weirder, stranger, than we have any capacity to imagine even with all our special effects and science fiction perspectives. And. Uh, I think the, the, the world is going to get really bizarre. And I'm glad that if you're in Jesus Christ, it's academic. We'll watch it from the mezzanine, right? <laughs> Jesus did tell us, except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Well, we've talked about a handful of topics. Interest time, I won't beat this to death. Um, uh, I'll leave you with one last thought. And that's that we live in hyperspaces in the first place. Nachman in the 12th century said the universe has, from reading Genesis 1, he said the universe has 10 dimensions, only four are knowable. That was his view. Particle physicists today tell us that we do live in 10 dimensions, only four are directly measurable, length, width, height, and time. Six are curled in less than 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. If you, read, if you look at our thing, learn the Bible in 24 hours, our perception of Genesis is that the 10 dimensional universe was split into the physical and what we call the physical and spiritual realms. And uh, many of the things we may be experiencing may be trans-dimensional uh, phenomenon. David Bohm was a protege of Einstein and one of the world's most respected quantum physicists. His land, he did landmark work in plasma physics. He believed at the subatomic level, locations seemed to cease to exist. It's like the universe is some kind of giant hologram. John Bell, back in 1964, formulated a mathematical approach to demonstrating, to explore the possibility of non-locality. There wasn't the technology then, but 1982, Alan Aspect and his colleagues at CERN conducted a landmark experiment. They demonstrated that subatomic particles have no locality. And I won't go through the physics of this. They took photons going in opposite directions with filters that switched fast enough that they demonstrated that the photons, all photons, know what the other photons are doing instantaneously. And that means they have no locality. Anyway, so the whole, our whole concepts of reality uh, are being altered. We're discovering that we all are in a gigantic simulation. If you want to understand one colorful entertainment piece, I encourage you to rent a movie called 13th Floor. It's just a piece of entertainment. It's a clever, it's a clever script. I think relatively well performed, but it also give you a whole different perspective of our own, uh, our own uh, society. But part of our tra the myopia of our life is that we are force-fitting discoveries into obsolete models. And uh, again, in the interest of time, I'll skip into this. Um, I think man is invading a world of which he has only the faintest glimpses. And the uncharted impacts can replicate unseen. They can transcend borders, species, and generations. And only the most committed people can persist in denying the role of a deliberate designer or creator. And we need to uh, recognize that you and I were fearfully and wonderfully made. For thou hast possessed my reins, the psalmist says, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. 
Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being incomplete, and in thy book all my members are written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. When did God first start dealing with you? Before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1.4. God bless you.